All right. So welcome everybody and thank you for taking the time to see our talk. Uh, we are happy to be here at the DEF CON Red Team Village and we are very excited to share with you some of the findings that we've been doing from um, since we did a talk in uh, uh, previews Red Team Village Summit where we try to showcase and, and, and expose basically how dangerous is the, uh, the leakage of credentials on the internet. And today, me and Jose Hernandez, my colleague, are gonna be presenting Had My Keys Been Pound API Edition. So let's get going. So most of you know who we are. Uh, I'm a principal security research engineer at Splunk. I work with Jose at Prolexic, uh, which is now Akamai. I worked at Akamai for a while. Then I went to Caspita and uh, came back at one point to Splunk. I co-founded Hack Miami and Pacific Hacker Meetups and Conferences. And uh, I run my own CTFs. Some of you may have Bladen, which is the command and control, and of course, CTF. And Jose, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm also a, a principal security researcher at Splunk, uh, old, long, long time friend of, uh, of Rod from our Plexic days, um, which got uh, purchased by Akamai. Um, I co founded a company called Zenage, uh, which uh, is now Oracle's uh, web application firewall and DDoS services, and returned to Splunk to do uh, research, security research. And this is one of the things that we've been working on that I'm super excited about. Awesome. So let's move on. So, so just before we, we get into basically what we're going to show you today, it is important that we recap a little bit or how we got to this point. Um, and, and in order to recap to, to a point where we can understand how bad and how we got to this uh, very bad situation, we need to understand or uh, take a look at what is DevOps. So, so as we have um, approached it before and explained it, DevOps is a set of practices that basically is, is within software development and team operations. It has become very popular. It's not really new, but it has become very popular and it has been um, widely adopted as most uh, companies are starting to somehow get a, a a foot in the cloud platforms. Some of them have radically moved most of their operations to the cloud. And when we're talking about developing software and producing software, building, coding it, planning it, testing it, releasing it, uh, the first thing that comes to your mind is DevOps. And DevOps is a, um, a set of practices usually guided by some uh, software development principles, um, and uh, the most popular currently is Agile, and uh, some of you might be familiar with Agile uh, if you have worked in a software development company. I work for now for three software development companies, and, and all of them were using Agile, and this is how I was exposed to the uh, not only the infrastructure, but the risks that are associated with this. So next, next slide, please. So one of the things that um, I noticed throughout the years and uh, me and Jose have been researching on is that when you use this set of principles uh, and uh, divide it in things that are called tool chains that go in the DevOps process, um, there's a number of products and a number of tools that are uh, constantly used, reused, shared, um, and uh, repurposed. Uh, one of the uh, uh, characteristics of, of the, um, to say in a certain way, the, the platform that is used for development, software development is at times uh, his ephemeral character, meaning for example, that you can create containers, destroy them and then simply recreate them again. So in order for us to give this a little more structure into what we can look at when we're trying to gauge the disposal and risks associated with DevOps, we had to look at, at DevOps tool chains. And DevOps tool chains basically are 
a combination of tools that aid in the delivery, development, management of software, and applications for the entire cycle. As you saw previously, it, there is an, an actual cycle where you code, you build, you plan, release, or you, you test it, and then you go back again. And, and if you are, for example, in a specific um, methodologies, for example, like Agile, usually there are sprints, and sprints are sets of times so that you have to produce a number of features or, or bug fixes. And all of this is based um, in a flow that goes through what they call the tool chain. So in the tool chains, you can see there are things that are used for planning, such as Git or Jira. There are things that are used uh, for coding that uh, involve uh, coding uh, code repositories. Uh, there are uh, things used for testing that implicate things such as Selenium or Bagram um, or uh, um, Docker containers, for example. Uh, there are things that are uh, tools that are made for software build, um, such as Ansible or Terraform or Chef. And then, of course, there are things that are within the tool chain for what they call deployment, which imply things such as Kubernetes uh, in uh, Docker, for example, most of these things um, like Kubernetes it, at times are throughout the entire process. Uh, and depending on your um, cloud provider, you may be very familiar with some uh, um, orchestration automation languages such as uh, uh, Ansible or Terraform. And then finally, part of the uh, uh, this tool chain is the monitoring part. And then we have things usually, the main two uh, monitoring tools are either based on uh, EOK, which is Elasticsearch, and of course, Splunk. Next, please. So once we have seen the picture of the two chains that are associated with the software development plus the cycle throughout the flow of planning it, coding it, building it, testing it, releasing it, and then coming back, there's one thing that we're focusing today, and that is credentials. Credentials are part of the entire process. Credentials are needed for many reasons. And um, here's a little bit of a, some of the, 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 the highlights of, of what happens in this process with credentials. So developers, for example, usually have high privilege credentials. Why? Because they have to, they have to be able to test things that would run with uh, low privileges. They are uh, uh, supposed to develop things that may be uh, kernel libraries, uh, sockets that need to be uh, created with services or connections. Um, these environments at times uh, are usually ephemeral, uh, like I said, and as a result of that, uh, so many times they're dismissed and poorly monitored. Uh, we're seeing cases of developers downloading anything from Docker Hub or who knows what have you, uh, a container repository on the internet and simply putting that in their DevOps to change without any checking, without any scanning. And now you may have uh, implanted containers, vulnerable libraries, vulnerable operating systems that will eventually affect and, give, and be published into your production environment. Um, obviously, this is related as well. There's a disconnection between uh, development and security operations. Uh, I've been part of uh, this problem. Many times that I have interacted with developers, developers usually don't like when you tell them that their code has bugs or vulnerabilities. Um, most of the times there's not a straight link in between what they're developing. So I'll give you an example. You have a development department and they, they download, for example, all these containers or libraries or code. Um, many times there are no tools to verify this. Many times there are not. Uh, inventory of, of, of what is it that they're downloading, what is it that they're using, uh, what libraries they're putting into uh, um, the software packages. So this, this, this by itself is a risk. 
Um, and uh, as well, uh, this is also um, very popular and this is part of the nature of the DevOps process. There's a spread use of uh, open source tools and code. Uh, so basically many times I notice in these environments that this code is trusted by result, by, by default. Meaning they just go, oh, I know this developer, oh, I know this group, I'm just gonna download this and, and use it in my application. Uh, and again, this, this goes back to the disconnection, but it is, there is some sort of a uh, honor code between the open source community where do no harm is, uh, is always the driver of software development. But it does not mean, and we have seen this in supply chain attacks, that uh, malicious actors, nation states, uh, criminals in general may, may target these repositories, these open source communities and embed by stuff in it. Um, also, uh, embedded credentials usually end up in public repositories and that's pretty much what we're going to show you today. How even big companies, how uh, individuals that, um, it, Unfortunately, uh, 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 there is no mechanisms. I, in, and all in all, we don't blame them for, for what you're about to see. We don't think that they're purposely leaking these this, uh, credentials. However, it is important that we point this out in order to bring awareness that there has to be mechanisms created in order to avoid uh, the rampant, because there's no other name for it, there's rampant leakage of uh, credentials and we will show today how bad it can get. So uh, when we have uh, also the development uh, departments and DevOps processes where um, most of these developers have uh, high privilege uh, credentials uh, or permissions, there is obviously a higher risk of insider because it takes less of an effort to cause harm, to embed malicious stuff in it, or to even destroy it. Like we had seen in, in some cases before where a person that was part of a development department has come back or a system has come back and uh, uh, do harm to uh, uh, employer. And uh, another uh, a couple of points is that the, the, due to the CSD uh, nature, the continuous uh, delivery, uh, basically, that cycle that goes around building, um, testing, developing, and uh, uh, coming back and plan again and on software, uh, the, these things get published immediately. That's one of the nature of the DevOps process is, is the DevOps process has shortened the time where you plan, code, build, test, release, uh, basically becomes something almost immediate that goes into production. And this by itself represents a risk because when you, uh, like I told somebody, when you, when you have vulnerabilities in, in, uh, in environments that, that are uh, driven by CI, CD and things like, for example, an implanted container and you have very large environments, the risk and the opportunity of exploitation increases in orders of magnitude. So uh, finally, and, and just to put this, to make this even worse, unfortunately, uh, the cloud environments have made this risk high, even higher. Why? Because basically you are connected to the internet, you publish right away, you stage right away, uh, and um, if there are attackers that are knowledgeable and are able to, to the pretty much footprint your process, they can do a lot of harm. Next up, please. So here's a little bit of a, for you to, to have a reference of how uh, the, the cloud providers manage credentials. We're gonna focus mostly on cloud uh, related environments. So here's, for example, um, AWS, they have their own AIM credential service. Uh, which usually had things such as passwords, access keys, uh, key pairs, or SSH keys. Uh, and also they do have a number of temporary security credentials that can be created uh, on the go and that uh, sometimes uh, have a feature whereas you can give a, a specific user access to 
uh, temporary access to a resource that otherwise that user does not have access for. So next up. Most of the, the providers have sort of similar um, systems for uh, managing credentials. However, it, I, I had to give kudos to uh, Microsoft because they are trying actually to tackle this problem. And as you can see here, they, they do have, this is an example of, of, of uh, how they manage credentials. They, they use the uh, Azure, uh, there's a framework within Azure, uh, uh, Active Directory where, <clears throat> sorry, where uh, it tries to avoid the, the, embedding, uh, the embedding of creds and they use a different mechanism. We're not gonna uh, uh, focus on this um, feature of Azure in this talk, but it's, it's important for you to consider it and look at it uh, because they, they definitely seem to be aware of the issue. Next up, please. And then uh, here's, we wanted to give you a little uh, sample of, of basically what's happening with, with the three main cloud providers, which is AWS, uh, GCP, and Azure. In the case of uh, GCP or Google Cloud, they are, most of the stuff is based on OAuth, uh, which is a, uh, a, a protocol that's used for identity federation and, and single sign-on. Um, and, for the most part, because of the constant interaction and services um, that are uh, present in cloud environments, obviously these providers have to come up with a way to allow the interaction of either devices, users and services, dividing and trying to establish boundaries between these entities. And, and as we uh, will see soon, this is very challenging. So next, uh, so here's a, a general, um, when you're looking at credentials, uh, things that you need, you need to, to uh, consider uh, that are usually uh, used and as such potentially exposed uh, when uh, you have developers that are publishing or storing code in uh, public repositories. So things as email and password, uh, username and password, uh, Remember, there's a difference between your local, for example, a Active Directory or LDAP and the a cloud um, identity access management. Uh, sometimes this brings up a lot of uh, uh, confusion uh, and um, depending on the integration that you have with your cloud environment, this may or may not play in your favor. Meaning if you're not very integrated, uh, losing, for example, the username and password from a, uh, a specific cloud service would not allow the attacker to access your internal environment. Also, um, multi uh, multiple factor authentication is, is something that's been common and uh, um, uh, at times it can be bypassed by certain frameworks. Uh, we've done some work before with uh, Evil Jinx uh, which basically is able to capture uh, the second, uh, the authentication or the, the, the TOTP, whatever interface is presented to the user and bypass MFA. Access keys, we, we talked about it. Key pairs, uh, we talked about it. Uh, specific account identifiers, and at times they use uh, uh, X.509 certificates. Next up. So why are the primary source of leaked credentials? Well, as you will see soon, uh, GitHub is probably the most popular uh, code repository on the internet. GitHub is now used for many other things, storing files, uh, even hosting web pages, which is uh, kind of cool. Uh, so GitHub is like the reference when it comes to uh, the leading internet um, code repository, not only publicly, but many companies use it. And then we also have GitLab, and we also have Amazon S3 uh, um, bucket storages, because the reason why I put this here is because you can definitely search for Amazon S3 buckets that are open or have writing or read privileges. And there's not only data is stored in it, but 
tons of uh, code with possibly embedded keys are usually found in these environments. Next up. All right, so I, as I, uh, I was explaining with uh, GitHub and GitLab and even S3 buckets, um, they're not just the only source of leak credentials. As you can see right now, I basically Google, Google Dork AKIA, which is usually how Amazon permanent keys start. And I was able to find the snippet. Fortunately, the person that posted this sanitized his keys, but that doesn't mean this happens all the time. Uh, and with this, I just wanted to show you an example that it's not just code repositories, it can be anything. I actually had a friend that lost his uh, username and password for a, uh, his Gmail and it turned into an absolute nightmare. The attackers actually reset everything he had and it took him like a week and even him being part of the community to get a hold of Google in order to reset this. So, so please be very careful with these things. And, and that was a, uh, my friend was, was working for a, uh, for a very large company, but there are other examples that we're gonna show you where the attacker may not be so obvious yet cause even more damage. So let's go on the next one. So before we can continue on this um, presentation, it is important for you to understand that uh, when we look at the context and nomenclature of attacks uh, on the internet, on the cloud, or, or inside the perimeter, uh, we are always looking at MITRE cloud attack matrix in this case. Uh, like I said before, we were gonna focus on cloud related type of environments. So in this case, uh, we're talking about basically unsecured credentials. Unsecured credentials, so for example, if you leave a credential in an Amazon S3 bucket or it's embedded in some code in GitHub, can lead to things such as what is called valid accounts, and valid accounts can be used for initial access, persistence, lateral movement, and privilege escalation. And I'm gonna give you a, an example of it as we move on in this in this this presentation so just keep this in mind so let's move on uh, one of the things that we we we're uh, looking at here is is a technique uh, which is t ten seventy eight dot zero zero four which is valid account cloud accounts it's, it's, so we're, you're obtaining cloud accounts that basically um, in one of the scenarios that we're going to propose, uh, you were able to, to find access keys that then allow you to not only access the provider, but move laterally and escalate privileges. Um, this, uh, these attack vectors are real. Uh, and many times, uh, they get dismissed because the company in, 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 in being honest to you, they do not have an awareness of the reach of the cloud within their perimeters. As we move on in the cloud adoption, there is many hybrid environments and in these hybrid environments, parts of your cloud infrastructure would allow access to your perimeter, either because of the developers do it or because you are in IT operations and there are some servers that have some access to, to S3 buckets, for example, or you have a WAN or you have a cloud VPN. So these are scenarios that are important to consider that are real. There's the line between the perimeter and the internet gets blurred or even disappear with uh, the adoption of cloud technologies. And here's an example, uh, something that you should read on. I know this is a, a, an evolving framework and then we may be giving you a number that will change tomorrow or even the definition of it, but it's important to understand that there is some work associated with these attack vectors and these vulnerabilities, and this is what we're trying to uh, showcase today. Next, please. So here, as I set this stage, um, I, I wanted to give you a, a little bit of a, an example and something that uh, we are actually working right now and we will be uh, presenting more research in the future, which is lateral movement and escalation of privilege uh, by simply 
uh, obtaining keys, right? You can obtain keys. Um, Jose and I did a presentation uh, which was called uh, Red Teaming DevOps in the Mayan Summit of Red Team Village, where we explain ways of either phishing or finding these credentials, which we're going to show part of it today. But for example, if you were able to get, sure, if you remember how I was able to go Google for a permanent keys and AWS, which is started AKIA, you can do things as you can, depending on the, on the actual um, uh, uh, user, you can even create new trust role policies. You can add yourself to role trust policies. So for example, let's say there was a, a trust policy that allows you to access certain buckets where there is um, sensitive data, you will be able to basically uh, access that data by simply uh, starting from the compromise of these keys, or you can create temporary keys by, their, by either STS assume role or a guest session token. It will depend on the, on the policies that are in place and the privilege of the users. However, this is not, uh, the boundaries that are, are not that uh, strict. Uh, and because this is an evolving and new technology, it's not that difficult uh, or far-fetched to say that if you're able to get a permanent keys that have been leaked on the internet, you might be able to basically go around in a specific environments. So here's an example how you can abuse tokens in a, specifically in AWS by uh, either obtaining uh, a permanent keys or compromising a session where they're already using temporary keys, which usually start by ASIA. Uh, and then from there, you can have used temporary tokens using things such as Assume Role. Assume Role is a uh, cross-account feature given by AWS to, for example, provide temporary access to a user, to a, a resource that, that he may not have access to, or uh, things like Get Session Token, which are permanent, uh, temporary, sorry, temporary tokens that can be used for specific features. So please be on the on the on the lookup for these things because they are this is this is this has not really exploited as in uh, publicly available but it's, it's definitely something that is happening right now to so next please and with that i'm going to pass it to jose and we're going to see an awesome demo hey um so give me two seconds here i'm going to go ahead and share uh my terminal as well as the slides um, let me know when, uh, Rock, can you confirm? You can see both the terminal and the sites. Perfect. Okay. Sweet. So, so I want to do a demo live today, if everybody's okay with that. I uh, don't usually do this, but, um, I'm so confident that again, like I'm so confident like how comfortable this tool runs and finds leaks. Um, I want to do it live and, and what I'm going to show in the demo today are basically three three basic steps of how you would use GitLaw, the tool that we built to find new credentials in GitHub. Um, the first step is going to be installing it and deploying it. Second step is going to be searching for leaked AWS credentials. And then the third step, we're going to just really quickly dig into that data that it gets generated from one of our searches or hunts. Um, so the tool, I already have the, 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 the tab here prepared, the, the tool is on GitHub. Uh, unsurprisingly, we're <laughs> literally, we're, we're searching GitHub for leaks and we're also using GitHub to host our code um, under uh, DBS1, GitHub uh, Hunt. So I'm just gonna go ahead and just clone the project really quickly here. And that's gonna bring our project down. I'm just gonna get back to our slides. So, just a few notes. Uh, again, going back to just uh, um, while this is coding down, uh, to Brad's point, like this leaking credentials is totally no. I've actually made these mistakes before. I've been in incident responses where colleagues have made these mistakes. Um, it happens. Uh, it, and there's very few mechanisms today out of the box to protect it, but they're good mitigation mechanisms out, uh, out there. It's just, again, to Brad's point, it hasn't exploded yet, so it's not actively. Uh, being mitigated for either. Um, so here we go. We clone down GitLaw Hunt, and the first step to install it is well, I'm, I'm going to go prepare a virtual environment, uh, and I use virtualenv for this. 
so we're creating a virtual environment in Python 3, and this is just in order for us to install all of our dependencies separated from our system Python. Uh, and so the next step is I'm going to activate my virtual environment and then install my required dependencies for the project. Uh, the project is pretty lightweight. There's not a whole lot of dependencies in here, so it should complete pretty fast. And now I have a, uh, uh, now my, yeah, the tools should execute just perfectly fine. And the tool is pretty straightforward. Um, there's a config file that you really don't have to do much with it besides, uh, uh, besides uh, configuring the actual uh, GitHub API token. So now that we've configured our token in there, um, we should be ready to go. And what I'm gonna do here in this case is I'm gonna use one of the example switches that the tool already has out of the box. Um, by the way, the tool actually, before I jump into running it really quickly, I, I, let me walk you through really, uh, how the tool kind of functions. Um, the first function of it is you pass it a, a, a search parameter and this is the equivalent of, of, the equivalent of a GitHub event search. And, and we have a few examples in here, like how to find GCP JWT tokens, JWS API in secrets, Azure JWT tokens, so on and so forth. Um, and then once, what it does is it's gonna go ahead and search GitHub for, for files that match these patterns. And then it checks, it, it reads every single file that returns in the results and it checks whether that file has a valid credential um, from a set of regexes. And, and by the way, Huge kudos and, and credits to Truffahog, which is the project we're actually borrowing a lot of these regexes from. Uh, but it's a two function, basically a two-step function tool, right? First, it searches for leaked, uh, potentially leaked files, and then it verifies that inside those files, you actually have credentials in them. Um, in this case, again, I, I, let's, let's, uh, let's try to run an example for pulling back your WSC tests, right? Boom. And so once we run it, um, the first thing we're gonna get back is the total results that we found in GitHub for files that match this. And then you're gonna, uh, the tool is gonna go ahead again and process every single result, right? And, and it's printing out here the actual URLs, checking whether there's actual credentials in them. And, and here we have our first kind of hit from Bill Rosie, where he actually committed a AWS secret. And if we actually go into this URI, should be able to see his AWA uh, access key. It's gonna open it here in my browser. And yep, there you go. That's literally his secret key and uh, it's out of the EU central region. So as Rod explained earlier with this key, we literally have the exact same permissions that Bill Rosie had in managing AWS. Uh, and so the tool, again, the tool runs and it's, it's gonna take a few minutes because there's 200 <laughs> something results, right? We're about a you know, leak number five, 95. And it collects all this data and saves it into a, a JSON file, essentially. Now, while the tool is running, I, I, I wanna go ahead and, and show you a bit of, uh, so we, we grabbed the data out of this JSON file. I'll, I'll show you at the end of the execution what it looks like, but we grabbed all that data. We've been collecting this leaks for about seven days now. And I pull some quick, uh, uh, like Ron and I pull some quick reports on like what what we've collected so far in the past seven days. And for example, for top leaks or top leaks by technology, we have by far a whole lot of AWS API keys out there that we've collected that have been leaked. And second to that is GCP actually service accounts. I couldn't say I wasn't so. I, I, I would, this did not surprise me. I don't know, Rod, if you got surprised when you saw this data set, but this was kind of somewhat expected. Like AWS by far is the secret that gets leaked the most. Um, somewhat surprising, there's still a lot of private keys for RSA out there, which I was not expecting. Um, another thing that, again, just another curiosity is that uh, AWS secrets, if you break this down by the last seven days, um, it doesn't vary a whole lot. It, it seems that like by far, again, AWS seems to be the normal thing that gets leaked the most, a second to, to GCP. Although um, uh, this YouTube, what they call YouTube OAuth tokens, and, and or the tool calls YouTube OAuth tokens are actually like a, a generic uh, OAuth tokens as well for, for, for Google. It just considers it like a, a, a specific YouTube one, but it's not. And so you can see that actually varies every, every, every so often across days. And, and, and so for the most part, people are either leaking their Google uh, suite 
tokens, which is really what the YouTube uh, OAuth token are, or the GCP tokens, which is pretty bad because, again, now you have full access to whatever they can do with, with uh, Google on their account. Um, we did a breakdown as well by top companies. And, 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 and mind you, where this data comes from is uh, the, if, if the user, because we're, we're, we're searching GitHub, and GitHub gives the users abilities to input things like, you know, what blog they have, what their Twitter handle is, and the profile, and what company they work for, um, we pull that information back when we have a match, um, since that's open data. And, and this is just a, a, a very, very ugly picture of like what the most credentials by company that we collected were. Uh, X by Orange uh, is by far the company that leaked the most, or at least that was labeled to leak the most, but we got some pretty big ones out here, like Nordstrom, VMware. Uh, and again, these are the top, like uh, uh, you see here, the other flag means that there's a bunch of credentials that were leaked, but not necessarily multiple of them, right? These, these are like multiple credentials for, for some of these companies. Um, Microsoft was in there. <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty pretty bad, let's just say. Yeah, so this is this is a very revealing because many times, and it's like what Jose was just saying. There is there doesn't seem to be awareness of how bad this is, and and we're trying to show you a picture of we collected what a week or so, and and look all the stuff we have, and we actually. We, we basically did this for, for analytic purposes and, and to show uh, uh, awareness. We could have delved even deeper into this data and who knows what we would have been able to get. And if we are doing it, bad guys are doing it too. So that's, that's, this is something that's very remarkable that you see some big names in there. I understand there is a number of mitigation issues. Like you can say, well, you can get my key, but if your IP is not in my uh, security group, you will not be able to log again. True. But we don't know that. And the fact that you put that uh, um, or the, those um, um, keys are being leaked, it opens the possibility. It's almost like an open port. That's how I see it. It's almost like an open port of a vulnerable application. Yeah, and one, one note I wanted to uh, say about this data also, and that's a really good point about it. Th this, again, because this is what uh, individuals have put in their company profile. Um, we, there's some garbage in here too, right? Like this LinkedIn profile or ABC, um, which we necessarily haven't cleaned out of our data yet. Um, but this is straight up, again, the users that we collected or we've seen leaks for, what companies they put in their profile. Um, and, and again, we also kind of want to break this down by region. Uh, my favorite region so far that uh, users have listed is In Your Heart. This is uh, pretty sweet. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> but I, I, unsurprising, and actually, Rod, you, you made this point to me, unsurprising, um, there is, you know, big cities that have a lot of development um, uh, footprint, right? Like a lot of developers and a lot of a huge tech footprint are showing up here, right? New York, Mar well, this is the Mars Park in New York, Santa Monica, San Francisco, Sweden, um, Russia, uh, Pittsburgh, right? So, so again, uh, the cities that typically have huge companies that are development or a lot of developers in there. Um, Again, the data, we haven't really cleaned up the data, hence why you have in your heart in here. Uh, but I just want to give you a really rough view of like what, if, if we were just trying to aggregate this really, really quickly, and we did it for seven days, what it looks like. Right, um, and, and if, you were, if, you were, if you were targeting a company, right, which is where you and I were talking yesterday, or we can hypothesize that by the number of leaks and if we reduce that to the regions, because we know where most of the developers are working, even though that's changing a little bit because of the work from home, uh, that sort of uh, cuts off a little bit of the work that an adversary uh, of, uh, needs to do in order to try to infiltrate one of these big companies uh, that by omission or, or, by, or willingly may have developers uh, that are posting keys uh, that are revealing too much. That's, that's, that's true. That's right. I, I, by the way, our tool finished here. I just want to give uh, give uh, the viewers here a, a quick preview of what the the results file gets written as. So if I just um, it's going to pass this to JQ since it's a, a valid JSON. 
you can see here the data we're collecting, right? So again, we're, we're, we're dumping every result that, that's getting matched into uh, uh, an, array, uh, an array of JSONs here, or actually for various JSON objects, and we collect the URL where we found the leak, um, the check that it actually matched, the, ma the different matches, right? So um, in the matches, I purposely went out of my way to not necessarily store the actual secret, but mainly just the keys if possible. Um, the owner, like, so who owns that repository that, that leaked that credential, owner URL, the type, again, if it's a company, it's gonna get listed as a, as a company. Um, the name, email, again, if they listed it, the company in their GitHub profiles in, in their blog, the location if it got listed, and this is where this data is coming from over here, Twitter handle, so on and so forth, right? And again, the, some of these fields tend to be null if the users don't allow their profile on GitHub to show this data for them. That's the only way. That's 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 the only way we can actually read it. Um, but yeah, again, pretty telling, uh, pretty telling data set. And and with that, actually, I. I I kind of want to talk about one example that stood out to the CEO of a, uh, of a telecom. I'm not going to say more than that. Um, it was pretty wild that, again, because the CTO had listed on his GitHub profile the, his, his uh, Twitter handle, um, as well as his personal blog site, we were able to find his LinkedIn and essentially for pretty day. much everything we we found yeah. pretty much everything about this gentleman and uh uh he you know we we obviously we have sanitized everything so you you can't find him yourself but uh -huh. but just like him there is many many cases of people this that we found example, right? right this is just we an talk, example we've yeah. contacted him again to clean things up our intent is to make sure these things stay clean up that's where we're, i want to like again we want to bring awareness as this is a big issue and 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 again I, i've made these mistakes in the past but this is how how, uh, how bad things can get essentially right right, uh, right. you can go for a simple it's amazing that you can go for a simple right. key to pretty much everything from 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 a leak key to the opening the the the, the doors of the of your company uh revealing your personal life personal things so please be careful with these things and uh, uh try to implement some some measures that that or mechanisms that that, that will mitigate this type of incidents look uh I also want to say thank you very much for listening to our presentation and watching it. And, and we'll be on Discord to answer any questions uh, any of you have. And again, Rod, thank you so much also for, uh, for introducing the topic. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Jose, for uh, being with me today and presenting. And then thank you to all of you. I hope you do find this uh, useful. And uh, please reach out to us and, uh, via Twitter. And uh, we'll continue the conversation. We'll be around to answer your questions. Like a day, everyone.